We just listened to the first two episodes of a new podcast, and we want to tell you all about it. The show is called Nobody Should Believe Me, and it's a groundbreaking investigation into Munchausen by proxy. Anyone who listens to Murder Sheet knows we really appreciate a deep dive into a subject. Well, no one has ever done anything of this depth and breadth on the topic before. You will be enthralled by the stories it tells, but even more importantly, you will learn a great deal about how to keep kids in your community safe from harm. But what makes this show different is that the host of the podcast, novelist Andrea Dunlop, has a uniquely personal connection to this subject. Someone close to her was investigated for Munchausen by proxy a while ago. So to her, this is not just something that happens to other people. Her personal story really gives this show an emotional punch. It also means she really makes an effort to get at the humanity of all of the people involved, all the victims and survivors. This isn't a podcast that focuses on the gruesome details. It has heart. Andrea really uses her storytelling skills to help us get to know the wide variety of people whose lives have been affected by Munchausen by proxy. New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen and subscribe to Nobody Should Believe Me on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. We get support from Audible. We've all got busy schedules. And I'm sure sometimes you feel like with all the things you have to do, it's hard to find time for the stuff you love to do, like reading. That's why Audible is so great. Audible offers an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre, from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, mysteries and thrillers, motivation, wellness, business, and more. Plus, as an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog, including the latest bestsellers and new releases. And also, I have to say, I love how the Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere, when you're traveling, working out, walking, doing chores, wherever your day takes you. Cleaning the bathroom has really never been more fun. Let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained. New members can try it free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash listening or text listening to 500-500. That's audible.com slash listening or text listening to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days. Audible.com slash listening. Ever look back on a decision you made and thought, now that was a great call? Well, once you start working with Monday.com, future you will be thinking just that. Monday.com is a work platform that helps your entire organization achieve more. With valuable insights, departments in sync, and a clear picture of where work stands, every business decision you make can be a great call. Help future you achieve more. To start your 14-day free trial, go to Monday.com. Content warning. This episode contains discussion of rape and murder. Last week, we told you about the I-70 killer a serial murderer who took the lives of six people at five different locations near I-70, the highway that reaches east-west from Utah all the way to Maryland. Today, we will continue our conversation with Michael Crook, the IMPD detective who caught the first of the I-70 killer's confirmed murders and has been involved with the case ever since. We will discuss the challenges of working a case involving so many different other law enforcement agencies and the possibility that the I-70 killer may have started his murder spree sooner than we thought and that it may have continued longer than we know. It is important to note that even though the I-70 killer's confirmed murders took place 30 years ago, it is not too late for this case to reach a resolution. Just last month, police succeeded in unmasking the I-65 killer, who is known to have operated primarily in the late 80s. This murderer targeted victims near I-65, a highway that travels north-south from the Great Lakes all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, and, thanks to decades of solid police work, we now know him to be a man named Harry Edward Greenwell. As we will see, it is also possible that Greenwell may be responsible for the I-70 killings as well. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders, 
1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, the murder sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout season one to give you a deep dive into undercovered crimes. We don't just rely on skimming the headlines. We dive into these cases to bring you in-depth coverage. We're the Murder Sheet, and this is Hunting the I-70 Killer, Part 2. Michael Crook joined with a team of investigators from multiple law enforcement agencies in different states to try to capture the I-70 killer. An investigation of that size and scope offers many logistical complications, but at its heart, it works like any other investigation. You simply try to find whatever information you can. You know, when you're doing this, you're searching for any kind of a clue, and, um, there are some crazy things that, that naturally happen and people would eventually call in and, and want to provide you information, which in many, many cases was, uh, was just very misleading, or, which could have been intentional or not. Crook recalled one incident where it was very much intentional. We went to Bloomington to track a guy down because the caller on that was his wife and everything she said fit. Everything, his description, um, everything. And our guy, you know, 5'4 to 5'7 with red tennis hair, and we got got down there to talk to the guy, and he was sitting on the porch, and he weighed about 400 pounds and had a big old black beard, you know, and he was laughing when we come up. He says, I know why you're here. My wife called. She caught me cheating on her, and, you know, so it's like, we spent, you know, hours looking at this guy and then the drive there to, to go talk to him and make sure that we were going to be safe in our approach to him and all that, only to find out she did it because she was mad at him at the time. So there's so many misleads that that uh, come in. And That incident happened decades ago. And it is important to note that the investigative team still works on the case to this day. We have continued to have uh, periodic uh, meetings uh, and communicate. We had a meeting in, in uh, St. Charles hosted, hosted this meeting where we again went through things and um, see if there was any new developments. And now having said that, that you know, over the years, we've still communicated by phone, but, uh, you know, we didn't have Zoom to be able to, to make these calls and, and, you know, things of that nature was just, but we did, you know, try to, to um, communicate with each other and and we did so. One thing the investigators have taken a close look at, of course, are the basic facts of the cases themselves to see if they offer any clues. For instance, during his known murder spree, the I-70 killer visited at least three different states. This guy is doing some serious uh, traveling. And also he commits these in a, in a period of less than a month here, or about a month, I guess. Um, so what what's going on that, you know, is he a traveler by business or by pleasure? Or uh, is he just out randomly doing this? Or, you know, what, what in the world's going on? And it's very hard to... Uh, really figure that out unless we we locate and talk to the individual. And it also may be important to note that the murder sites may have had something else in common besides their proximity to I-70. 
there's a you know I realize that that um, we all did I should say on our on our um, uh, task force that there's military establishments close to each of our um, locations and that um, uh, aside from that just being on the interstate you could have a trucker or traveling salesman it could be uh, just somebody you know that uh, maybe uh, got out of the service somewhere and was traveling and one of the good not a good theory but a theory was the fact that there were people um, Fort Harrison is located very close to uh, the first case here, Robin's death. And maybe during that time period, um, uh, people were being discharged out of Fort Harrison, uh, which, you know, subsequently turned into a, a park and, and everything up there now. Um, but could it have been a, some, you know, an individual who, uh, comes home from military or overseas in the Gulf War or whatever, and is uh, learns that his wife or girlfriend has, um, you know, no longer there for him, whatever the circumstances are, and just declares a war on women. Could that be? And the truth of the matter is, yeah, we haven't excluded that. That could be something has, you know, definitely made him angry uh, to to kill all these women. Um. Or is there something else, you know, just the the thrill of the kill? Throughout the entire process, Crook also had a constant concern. That's always a fear that I have had that somewhere along the line, maybe there's another case that happened that we don't know about. Or perhaps a suspect who has been arrested in something uh, that the, you know, the dots haven't been connected to these. So we, I think all of us work with that. That fear. Missing a case could be a crucial misstep. Each time the killer committed murder, after all, he potentially left behind clues that offer the possibility of leading back to him. The more cases there are to study, the greater the chance of finding one of these clues. Because this was so obviously important, it was an avenue the investigators spent a great deal of effort pursuing. Um, we attempted to locate another case that occurred before Indianapolis. Uh, we looked at uh, Interstate 70 uh, going back east, and, and uh, we looked, uh, you know, on 65, actually, going up to the Chicago area. And then later on, when when uh, St. Charles got involved in it, they did the same thing. We, we continued to search and and look and see if there were more along the interstate. Now, in the police communications world at that particular time, uh, we were, they had what they call um, uh, National Crime Information Center. It's NCIC, which is still around, but that's how we tried to communicate to other departments. We were sending out information as to what we had and ask other departments if they had anything similar to contact us. But that really didn't prove uh, to be uh, very worthwhile. We didn't get any anything that was uh, conclusive. Um, but then again, a lot of times, in, and especially in a big department, your NCIC operator is not a homicide detective, and so they may look at it and go, well, we don't have anything, and then, it doesn't go any further. So we always had the fear that maybe we missed something and, you know, we still could have. Then you, we also have things that would come up. It's like, you know, an investigator from another city or state will call us and, and uh, they were adamant that they had something that was connected and, uh, and they wanted to be connected, you know, uh, but we would, uh, we were able to, um, most of the time disprove that. But they did uncover two murders and an assault in Texas from 1993 and 1994, which many feel could plausibly be connected to the I-70 killer. The first of these crimes occurred on September 25, 1993. A 51-year-old woman named Mary Ann Glasscock was shot to death 
is she worked at a small antique store in Fort Worth. On November 1, 1993, in Arlington, Texas, a 22-year-old woman named Amy Vess was shot multiple times in the head and neck as she closed Dancer's Closet, a clothing store. Incredibly, she lived long enough to make a 911 call. She was even able to communicate that she had been robbed and shot by a male. But she lost consciousness before she could reveal more information, and she died shortly thereafter. The last of this string of crimes happened on January 15, 1994. 35-year-old Vicki Webb was working at a gift shop in Houston when a man came in. Vicki described what happened next to the Indianapolis Star. The man and I talked for quite a long period of time, probably around 20 minutes. We talked about merchandise. He was asking about business patterns. I thought maybe he was a retailer too. He didn't really look like one, but you never know. The man kept staring out the window, and then he made a request. Could he see a particular item from behind the counter? Vicky turned to get it for him, and that is when he shot her. I thought, oh my god, I have a 13-year-old daughter. Please, I just can't die now. She did not move, hoping that if she played dead, she could survive. The man took some money from the register and then left. But then he came back. He pulled Vicky to a spot behind the counter and then placed his gun to her forehead. Vicky heard a clicking sound, and then the man laughed. He left, and this time he did not return. Help arrived about 15 minutes later, in time to save Vicky's life. She later told investigators that the man who nearly killed her resembled the sketch of the I-70 killer. These attacks certainly seem to fit his pattern. We asked Crook what he thought about these cases. I, I guess I believe these are very possibly done by the same individual. However, I don't... I want to be careful how I say that, but Texas doesn't necessarily think that they're connected. And they have a different weapon. So... I have personally visited all the crime scenes, every single one of them, and I feel very strongly that these were, were, you know, probably done by the same guy, and and that's just my my feeling and based on what I've seen and, and looked at and so forth. But there are also other cases which might be linked to the I-70 murders, including one that has been in the news recently. As we mentioned briefly at the top of the show, in the late 80s and early 90s, an individual then known as the I-65 killer committed a string of murders along I-65, a highway that runs north-south. This individual, now known to be the late Harry Edward Greenwell, raped and murdered three hotel clerks and assaulted a fourth. The I-70 killer, of course, did not rape his victims. But he also traveled a major highway, killing people. Could there be a connection? Crook finds a detail in the I-65 timeline interesting. This Greenwell uh, committed sexual assault in uh, January of 1990 there in Columbus, Indiana. Um, The clerk was able to get away from him in that one. And then ours started in 92, uh, so we had ours. And then the next thing they have him being arrested again in October of 98. So we've got 92, 93, and and even, you know, on after that, that we can't really account for this guy. However, uh, we do know that it was uh, that the... uh, The uh, motive of uh, killing was different, uh, and weapon uh, was different than than our originals. Ours uh, was a uh, twenty-two caliber, 
weapon with uh, eight lands and grooves with a right hand twist, and and that's what you know we've been looking for. But it certainly um, doesn't eliminate the fact that um, he could have gotten rid of that weapon. Crook keeps returning to the timeline. So uh, Greenwall, um, 1990, and then our start in 92. And then if if ours would be connected, then the next ones that we're looking at is the, uh, the latter part then of uh, 93, September, November, and January 93, and January 94 in Texas. Okay, so what happens then between May 7th of 92 and September of 93? Um, if it is the same guy. And... Um, all right, so what are our possibilities here? Well, uh, you know, there's a lot of possibilities, and this uh, this hampers us, but you have, uh, what is it, about eight or nine months maybe? I don't know. What are we talking here? But even if we just say six months, um, what happened to this guy? Why does he go on this hot streak, and then all of a sudden, why does he stop? Again, when you when we rely on our our federal friends to to help us with the analogies here, uh, it, they um, these particular individuals can go on a spree like this and kill, 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 and then they get it out of their system and they're okay for a while. Or perhaps in our case, you know, I'm I'm wondering if uh, maybe the guy got picked up on another charge somewhere and maybe it was a gun charge even and they took his gun um again um you know when you look at uh, and i've driven this i-70 you know on this case and gone back and forth a number of times and when you get out in the west there there's sometimes and if you're especially off of 70 and you have little smaller towns and little marshal's office and sheriff's office. And certainly um, I, I wonder if someone may have arrested this guy in a gun charge and kept the gun. And, you know, maybe it's in their property room somewhere or, or a desk drawer even that, that they didn't give it back and or melted it down. Who knows? But he acquires another gun somehow. And the same caliber, I can tell you, was used in the uh, Texas cases, but it's a different it's different markings. So, but what happened to him? Did he get, um, if he's military, did he get deployed for a while or active duty somewhere? Or was he, in, you know, incarcerated for a gun charge or other thing? Maybe he attempted to uh, rob a place or, you know, with the intent of taking him back room but got caught. So there's a, there's a lot of unknowns there as to why it stops and then why does it start again and then why does it stop after, if he is connected to the 93 case and the 94 case, what happens after that period of time? This Greenwell is interesting, but, you know, he's also, we can't put him in and we can't exclude him really 100%. I just, I don't have the answer to that. For, for Greenwell, um, I have a question about him in particular. And, and just, I mean, I guess yeah. in your experience, um, would it be would it be common or, or possible for an offender like that to, uh, you know, it seems like he was sexually assaulting his victims. Would it be yeah. likely that he would not sexually assault some of these other women who he obviously had power over in those moments? Is that something that people I can, switch back and forth? Yes, I, I can answer that for you. And, and this is this is how it was put put to our group early on. They warned us to watch out because this guy might get bored with what he's doing and he may uh, change his his style. He, and one of the things we specifically talked about was the fact that in these these are relatively come in quick kill exit, right? As he's done this, he can get bored with just killing these women. And now decide to take on a different thing, which would be the the sexual assault. So, absolutely can change. And and 
you hate to think of it. How's a guy going to get, I mean, you know, for us, it's, it's, it's hard to put your spot or put yourself in this, this way of thinking, but, oh yeah, I'm tired of killing. Now I'm going to start having sex with these women and then kill them or after, you know, we've had a, there were a lot of them that we looked at, um, that involved uh, sexual assaults that um, we thought, well, maybe we got him, you know, on some of this stuff. But uh, it turned out, no, we were, it didn't happen. And we were able, through these sexual assaults, we were able to make um, make identifications and make arrests through, through other, um, through the DNA stuff. Crook has spent so much time thinking about this case that sometimes his mind takes a darkly humorous turn. I always, um, I always say that the I seventy guy, once I die, he'll come forward and admit he's just waiting on me to pass on. So it's a joke. <laughs> but wow. the other guys are like, "Yeah, I wish you'd hurry up and die then," you know. But uh, anyway, it just, it just haunts you and haunts you and haunts you. And then you got that thing in Tennessee and Franklin, Tennessee, too. The Tennessee case he refers to is one we mentioned to him. It is a case we covered last year. On February 1st, 1991, 49-year-old Peggy Cox was working the drive through window at a Hardee's in Franklin, Tennessee. One customer made his order and pulled up to the window to pick it up. But instead, he shot Peggy Cox in the head, killing her. He then drove off never to be apprehended. A police sketch of a possible witness was published in the newspapers shortly thereafter, and I realized the image bore a startling resemblance to the sketch of the I-70 killer. This sudden, senseless slaying seemed like it could fit his pattern, and we wondered what Crook thought about it. I thought that was very interesting as well, and that might be a tie-in. There is another case that is often mentioned as being possibly related to the I-70 killer, and that is the 2001 murder in Terre Haute, Indiana, of liquor store employee Billy Brossman. Much of this crime has been captured on video, and it reveals a gunman who strongly resembles the sketch of the I-70 killer. This man entered the liquor store, pulled a gun on Brossman, made him go to the back of the store, and then shot him in the head, murdering him. We are definitely looking at that one as a, as a possible connection to, to ours as well. In that case, there's some pretty good surveillance footage. Yes. Yep. And we've, um, we've shared that, and that's why we think, yeah, it could be. It, could, it very well could be. And then but here again, okay, when you, we were talking about this one, it's like, well, why didn't Terre Haute pick up on this, you know? And the reason is that, that um, we were looking for female victims. And that's why we, you know, we had to, we had assumed that, that if, you know, Terre Haute, they knew about our, our you know, I-70. They had one of their detectives on it, obviously. So they just didn't see or even think that they could be connected. But here again, if you go back to our original profile information, yeah, it could very well be. I was wondering, um, it, it, what gives you hope uh, going forward? It sounds like there's a lot of uh, dedicated officers who continue to be looking into this case. And, and I guess just if you could speak to that, what you know, what kind of keeps you going in terms of hoping that this will be closed out? Well, uh, there's a couple of things. Uh, number one is that um, I don't like to, you know, have any unsolved cases. There's a lot of them. I... I say a lot. There's, I didn't have very many, and I'm thankful of that. There, in most cases, I had a pretty, you know, a good idea who committed it, and maybe, you know, in some of them, the prosecutor wouldn't didn't feel comfortable with filing them. So, you, but you, you know, you're kind of st- stuck there. Uh, but with this particular one, 
there's there's two things that, that drive me on this. Number one is that the family. This is hard to explain sometimes, but the night that I went to their house and met them for the first time, you could you could just it was a tight family. I know for a fact that Robin, the victim, was the the favorite of the dad. Mom and dad both died. I think the the her her father died shortly after. I mean, it, this whole thing just killed him. And uh, but her her sister, uh, especially one of her sisters, um, has been with me. Um, as I say, I, we have a friendship now that. You know, and, and I want to be able to tell her that one of these days, this is the guy. And I hope that that um, that he's alive and that we're able to talk to him and to, you know, ask the questions that that family wants answered, all the families. And I just want to be able to do that, really, for that, that family. I don't think they always um, were supportive, you know, they, because I couldn't give them the answers that they wanted. Not, not that. I, I, maybe they just didn't like me or what I was telling them at that particular time. But as it, the time has gone on and I've, you know, grown more familiar with them and vice versa, and, and I've demonstrated to them how hard we are all trying. That, uh, um, you know, that makes a, a difference. And I just want to be able to tell, uh, tell them, hey, this is. This is who did it, and I'm positive. And another thing that that um, that we have been very cautious about is we have not said this, but it's okay to say it now. The guy is a coward. The man that is doing this and and doing this to these women is a coward. And we didn't want to put that out originally because you don't want to play to his uh, his mind and his whatever psychological thoughts he's having we we didn't do that but uh actually just recently and and talking <laughs> i was talking to larry and um, larry said i'm getting ready to do an interview with the guy over there in st charles and he i said yeah go on, let me know how it goes and next thing i know i'm reading his interview and he's calling him a coward it's like damn larry that went against everything you've always taught us you know and uh, he said, you know what, uh, it's time. Let's call him out, see if we can get him to. You don't want to generate more murders, obviously, but you do want to maybe he'll come forward or brag about how he's gotten away with it. So the, the psyche involved in these people, it's just, you know, you really have to be a psychiatrist that, psychologist or something to figure them out sometimes and um, I've got I've got a, a case that um, I'll keep it short for you but this guy he had um, he had stopped to help this lady one time with a tire and he followed her luckily he followed her she was smart enough she didn't go home she went to her mom's house and he followed her to make sure she got there okay. And then after that, he's buzzing mom's house. She sees him all the time. But she, but he didn't know where the girl actually lived. He ends up following her one night. And um, she comes out of a bar. And she's with her friends. And they kind of separated at, at, you know, when they came out to the parking lot. And he was able to force her into to his car. And he drove her out there in Hendricks County and ended up, you know, uh, she's fighting him and he, he, he um, ended up killing her. And you would think, okay, you, you know, okay. But then he, he shows up and this, I mean, I'm no brilliant detective here. You know, you got to go with your, you're locking your instincts a lot, but this guy shows up at the funeral and he's the first one there. And he goes up like he's part of the family in, you know, to view. And he asked the aunt, he said, Hey, uh, these eight by 10 pictures you got of her. Cause she was, 
decompose. He said, you think I could have one? And she's like, well, yeah, when we're done with the funeral, I guess you can have one. And then she starts asking, well, who is this guy? And nobody knew except mom said, I got a feeling that's the guy that changed the tire. Anyway, it was. And so the family's calling me and they're telling me. So we did the surveillance and all that. And uh, it was, this guy was, he was in love with her from the minute he met her. He believed that they belonged together, and and uh, so he took her, captured her, and took her out there, and then killed her, and then wanted to ensure that everything went well at the funeral. And he sent he sent more flowers than this girl's husband, and then he um, he had the uh, he went he was the last one to leave and and go uh, uh, to the cemetery. And the last one to leave the cemetery and he had to rearrange the flowers out there and all that kind of stuff. And it was like, wow, classic and uh, classic behavior here of, of somebody like that. And brought him in to interview him. He had um, her driver's license with him when I was doing the interview, but I didn't know it. And it was one of those things where I just didn't, we couldn't arrest. I couldn't arrest him, but I, I knew he was involved. But anyway, so I said, okay, I'll tell you what. How about coming back when I can arrange a uh, lie detector test? And I can tell you I don't do that. I hate lie detectors. I, oh, I, I think I've only had about used the polygraph people seven times in my career, but that's a whole different area to talk about. But anyway... The guy said he'd come back and talk to me and, and do the lie detector test. And then that night he shot himself uh, out in a field with a buddy and uh, had made the comment that, you know, he had killed her and tell my family I love her. And then he shot himself. And it's like, so anyway, I was able, um, you know, to clear that. But again, you know, the, if one goes through these people's minds and, you know, and if he hadn't showed up at the funeral home and, then all that it may not have been solved as, as quickly as it was. We appreciate Michael Crook taking the time to talk with us. And we also appreciate the time he and the other investigators have put in working on this case. It has now been 30 years since the lives of Robin Fuldauer, Patricia Majors, Patricia Smith, Michael McCown, Nancy Kitzmiller, and Sarah Blessing were taken. They have not been forgotten, and they never will be. If you have any information about these crimes, please call the St. Charles, Missouri Police Department at 1-800-800-3510. There is a $25,000 reward. In this episode, we relied on reporting from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the Indianapolis Star, the Tennessean, and KMOV. To our surprise, we've gotten a number of requests from people saying they would like a way to help financially support our efforts with the show. So, if you are interested, we are relaunching a Patreon page, which you can find at www.patreon.com slash murdersheet. Join us there for two live video question and answer sessions each month. You can ask us anything, suggest new cases for us to look at, or even offer ideas for new leads for us to follow. If Patreon is not your thing, you can buy us a coffee at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. Thanks for the interest. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenlee, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at M Sheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to The Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure and send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.